Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Bula, Buta. Please, yeah, the mic is there. Um, I'm from Calcutta, India, University of Calcutta. My name is Bula Bhadra. I have one question to Patricia and another to Neera. Uh, my question to Patricia is, can we disembed rights without dismantling capitalism, especially the destructured capitalism that is globalization, which faithfully guarantees formal rights but fetishizes substantive rights by denial. Okay. To Nira, my question is, one, if feminists have differences among themselves and intersectionality rightly creeps in, then should we re-engage ourselves in terms of feminist setting feminist agenda? Should we once again redefine the contours, etc., to see what will be feminist agenda? My second question is... I think we've take, we're going to be... Uh, for the okay. Era. Just, so let's try just, just, for the, just the second the question answer. is that, if possible, because this is a tall order, can we suggest one or two things for the sake of awareness for the next generation of feminists? Thank you very much. <laughs> Patricia, do you want to go first? Oh, yes. Um, thank you. It's a, actually, it really goes to the heart of the matter, your, your point, you know, which is, re I think that this, this issue has resonated throughout the three presentations, that we, uh, we, we have to have the courage to not only recognize that we are in a stalemate and we are just... Uh, Yes, swinging in the wind, <laughs> while uh, we're not going anywhere and our movements are incapacitated by this in so many ways. We have to be anti-capitalist, actively anti-capitalist, not only in terms of the rhetorics that we, you know, fill our texts with, or we have to find the new ways to be anti-capitalist in ways that create the alternative to capitalism. And we have to bring back the old language, the language of resistance. We, ha we mustn't be afraid to, to speak to the issues using the effective language that has served us very well, that has brought us to where we are. As, uh, whether we are speaking about feminism or whether we're speaking about working people's struggles, we do have a language that is really important and one of the things that neoliberalism has succeeded in doing is to remove that language from our lexicons, you know, and to make us feel embarrassed and uneasy about say, speaking in particular ways. So I think for us to imagine rights as accessible outcomes of struggle, of social struggle, we have to be actively anti-capitalist. One of the ways that I'm doing my anti-capitalism is by growing my own food. And you know, it isn't just some um, esoteric movement of you know, crazy people who are vegans, but it's really fundamentally about, for example, distancing ourselves from violence. Because the, the capitalist economy, the food economy is centered on violence deep, deep violence to other living human and other living beings, you know, and a disconnection of humans from other living beings. And an, a, a way of making us um, lose contact with the very energies that supply our creativity, our ability to think about alternatives. So that's just one way. I mean, there are many, many, many ways that we can step back from the system and, and begin to craft you know, alternatives. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Yeah. 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 I think part of my answer, um, you just hear, but I want to point out a couple of other things. First of all, we have to separate sharply between feminists and women. Mm -hmm. um, originally, in all these UN conferences and so on, the two things were taken as equal. And then the 
more and more women from the right, whether religious or secular, have started to occupy these spaces. This is why many feminists decided the UN is not worth all the effort because you invest so much energy just in order to stay in the same place rather than uh, progress further. So resolutions like saying let's have more women in peace, uh, peace processes can be very problematic because it's essentialized women as homogeneous peace, um, uh, peace lovers. I grew up in Israel of Golda Meir, I lived in Britain of Margaret Thatcher. For me, women are not necessarily peace lovers. <laughs> so we have to differentiate between, and this is very important when we discover issues of belonging and politics of belonging, social positions, identities and identifications, and normative values. Feminist solidarity should recognize the differences between various social positioning and various identifications of various um, feminists. But what allows transversal global feminist solidarity and other forms of solidarity is commonality of emancipatory values. And this is what is important, not by like the old left did by so-called universalizing and erasing the differences in social positioning and in identification because these are not just part of the subjective experience of people's uh, lives as well as the various economic, social and cultural capitals that they have in order to be able to access various kind of uh, resources. But if you, from your different situated gazes, you are able to share the same kind of values, you are able to work. And I, and, and I don't differentiate between this as an advice or observation of what we've been doing in the last 20 years, of what telling the next generation. I think that's uh, the way. But I think that at the moment there are two very important foci. One is the one that Patricia especially talked about, and this relates to what I, I call in other places the, the, the global systemic uh, crisis of um, and the neoliberalism of governability of states on the one hand, and that relates to issue, and government, governmentality of, of people on the other hand. And this crisis governmentality on the one hand produced all these progressive protest movements that were discussed last evening, but they also produce a lot of racist, uh, autochtonic uh, movements all over the place. You can see it in Greece, you can see it in Africa, you can see it in, no in Norway, you can see it um, uh, everywhere. And it's important to observe that at least three of the um, racist ex um, autochthonist uh, parties in Europe contemporarily are headed by women. And that the sexual rights of gays and, and, trans, and, and transsexual and, and so on, have become by these people very often an appropriation of so-called civilized Western culture. The same people who persecuted, you know, uh, uh, these people just uh, some years ago. So we have to look on the one hand on these issues of the crisis of neoliberalism and decouple democracy and capitalism. On the other hand, we have to focus on the issues of culture and resist religious and ethnic fundamentalist movements that have developed as defense, uh, identity defensive communities which uh, attempt to defend themselves against the, the, the crisis, against the uncertainty by exclusionary uh, models, again, those that they think do not belong. And in our world, it's a very risky and very terrible um, uh, danger exacerbated by uh, the crisis of neoliberalism and as well as the crisis of the environment and, and so on. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, I would like to follow on, on the comments of Professor McFadden uh, about stepping back from capitalism. And this comment really touched me profoundly. I'm a junior researcher, 
And at the moment, I want to step back from capitalism. But the best way I see to do it is to step back from academia, how it is currently. Yeah, and, yeah. But how can I resolve this with my need, my strive to change anyway society and to resist? So what is your suggestion? And this is an open question. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. Gracias por... Eh, la realidad latinoamericana ha significado desde que hace muchos años que he sido joven. <risa> eh, hace muchos años. Ha significado una suerte. Hay alguien que dijo, es un oxímoron en América Latina llamar a intelectual a quien es de derecha. Es una contradicción en sus términos. Eso no quiere decir que América Latina no haya derramado una cantidad de intelectuales articulados con el sistema. Pero la verdad es que eh, yo puedo mirar a muchos de los colegas y colegas, varones y mujeres que están aquí de Argentina, y entre todos nosotros hay una suerte de desideratum militante. Uh, es muy difícil separarnos en la tradición, de la, sobre todo de las ciencias sociales en, en la Argentina, en América, y sobre todo en la región latinoamericana del sur, de obligaciones morales con los colectivos oprimidos. Eso no quiere decir uh, uh, las dificultades entre el ser intelectual llamado por la academia y dormirse en los laureles fatos de la academia ha ocurrido. Pero creo, tengo la expectativa de pensar que, sobre todo cuando se renueva generacionalmente el oficio de la sociología, de las, de las humanidades en general, en nuestro medio, siempre ha tenido, está teniendo un aspecto radicalizado. Es una, yo he sido muy complaciente, seguramente, con una cierta visión optimista acerca de cómo se ha incrementado nuestro conocimiento, nuestra investigación en materia de géneros y sexualizadas disidentes. Ahora, por otra parte, me gustaría decirles, en un país como el nuestro, que ha vivido, yo he vivido casi toda mi vida fuera del Estado de Derecho, quien tuvo que exiliarse, la oportunidad de derechos formales sigue siendo algo importante. Desde luego, los derechos formales, como dice Nira, necesitan ser interpelados. Nosotras estamos evidentemente con muchos derechos formales y probablemente poca interpelación práctica. Nos, eh, pero querría decir que... Eh, no quiero hacer un, un estado personal. Me parece que es diferente de lo que se puede dar en, otras, en otros locus académicos, sobre todo el de Norteamérica o el de Estados Unidos. En general, nuestra actitud es siempre en el, una enorme proporción, sobre todo de las feministas académicas, tenemos unos compromisos activos políticos. Estamos, hemos incorporado luchas activas, luchas en la plaza pública, no solamente en nuestros, en nuestras, yo diría, en nuestros solipsistas mundos académicos. Creo que eh, es un poco diferente, estamos a, eh, de lo que ocurre en, en otras latitudes, probablemente en las realidades, en lo que ha contado Nira, etc. Me parece que... Si por un lado a veces nos dormimos en la torre de marfil, en general podemos decir que hay una experiencia de combate con nuestras actitudes académicas. A veces nos hemos equivocado, pero en general, por lo menos yo creo que ese es la principal, el principal objetivo que tiene nuestra vida y nuestras ciencias. Si no sirven para dignificar la condición humana, están de más. Okay. Uh,
the rest of us. Uh, before I say thank you, I do, first of all, I, I do want to also put a question forth. I decided I wait to the end. They're all very thought-provoking questions uh, and responses that you've given. One of the key aspects that has come up, and very often within the feminist movement, especially among second generation um, and younger people, is this idea of um, not being, of course, familiar with the feminist movement and the history of it, but also the corporati corporatization of both education and work, and actually co-opting feminist language in the process. So what was seen, what the feminist movement fought, right? And we talk about difference, and I know we know each other's work. But I think it's a, it's a really critical idea when you talk about resistance. How do we now fight back in terms of rights, the complexity of rights, because all the language of rights and feminist rights and th issues around violence have now been taken by corporations in, and the neoliberal state and the state coll colluding with corporations and banks. And so I really, because all three, and I know all of you have this history, and this is in academe too, right? All the language, that feminist language has been used has been wonderfully, very creatively taken by the right by the so-called responsible state and corporatization. So as we've been talking about the problematics of it and notions of resistance, can all of you, all three of you briefly uh, respond to it? Thank you. Okay. So, who should start? Oh, okay. As okay. I ask the question, I'll wait. Uh, thanks, Mary. I, I, think, I think this is a very, very important question. I recently started to think about Marcuse and his big refusal, as I haven't thought about him since the, the late 60s and, and, and the 70s. And I remember when I first, when I was doing my PhD, which was about the Jewish student movement, but, uh, and some other friends were doing on other forms of student movement, we sat and worked and looked at sociological Marxist and anarchist literature on issues of social change and co-option. And as a result of that, I changed from an anarchist to a socialist <laughs> because I realized you cannot read except of, of power except for certain moments. I mean, the, what we discussed, Tahrir Square yesterday, this mm -hmm. is an, a fantastic example, how we all looked, how wonderful, how peaceful, how no, issues of divisions of power and so on did not exist in, in Tauris and, and what is the reality, of course, as it unfolding mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So you can redistribute power, but you cannot get okay. mm -hmm. rid of power. But the issue of co-option has become so articulate. And what does it mean, big refusal? Growing up your own food, I, I think, is one act of refusal. But in a way, this is not something that most of us can actually do. Why not? Because um, <laughs> it will take too long to explain, but I <laughs> would love to sit over a cup of coffee, yes, which I did not grow welcome. myself, nor did you, and talk about this issue. Okay. Uh, well, um, I'm sorry that uh, the, I, I, the ageism is just so incipient in the language, so I will say the young woman. Um, uh, who asked the question because I really was excited. I wanted to, um, to, 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 to gift her with this if she would accept it as a gift. I think that consciously stepping back is so amazingly mm -hmm. powerful for your consciousness, for our consciousnesses as mm -hmm. radical people, as radical women. Because when you step back, you can assess the particular ways in which you can resist. Many of us, for example, I'm coming out of a context where the, the women's movement, because it's so deeply embedded in nationalism, um, has reached a point for me where uh, we're just spinning our wheels, you know, and the collusion with the neo-colonial state, with donors, etc., has robbed the women's movement largely of the, 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 the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. So stepping back is a way for me to reclaim my creativity to, um, uh, uh, for example, I write outside the system. I, I really, I do not publish 
through traditional publishers. You know, I will participate uh, an occasional article in a collection, but I, I, uh, I refuse, je refuse, uh, as Marcuse, <laughs> you know. Uh, yes, and I'm always looking for ways of saying the radical things that I hope will be useful and shared by other radicals, but to say them outside the system, because I, I don't accept that somebody can take the ideas that come out of the struggles of my community and my uh, region and make money out of it with property rights, you know, with intellectual rights. So it's a huge challenge for radicals. I know it's been there for a very long time, but the new technologies do offer okay. us possibilities. And I'm particularly, if you, may, if you could just oblige me for one uh, half a second, you know, the new technologies have caused deep, deep destruction on our African continent. Most people don't even know what the consequences of having a ubiquitous cell phone are for us that accompanies these minerals. So writing as and for resistance using new technologies, I think, is also a, a way of creating that critical distance, you know, from the system. But there are myriad ways in which we can resist. And taking back resistance is really crucial sure, sure. for Thank that. You. Good. Good. Thank you. Es encantador estar aquí con pensadoras radicalizadas, tal vez uh, es de un enorme estímulo para, para el fórum. Yo lo que creo es que el capitalismo es como Freud dijo desde el infante, es un perverso polimorfo. Entonces, pero lo que más le asusta a una es la capacidad de revival que tiene, de, de acomodarse. Tenemos la expectativa de que este sea el fin. Estos días todo está estallando. Asistimos a las irracionalidades más asombrosas. Millones y millones de euros dedicados al sabotaje de bancos, los bancos. Y la verdad es que eh, yo, que soy una optimista irredenta, pienso todos los días que estamos al final de la era, pero la era se entusiasma con alguna renovación. De todas las maneras, creo que es la acción humana la que está en juego y como soy una optimista y redenta, pienso que finalmente el perverso polimorfo cederá a una vida muchísimo más digna. Pero es una apuesta, es la apuesta pascal golmaniana. Apostemos, ¿no? Eso creo que es. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to the audience. I just want to take a quick moment to all of you who don't know as we talk about technology and how we have to have forms of resistance. So uh, we do have, and it's just been launched today, we have something called social justice and democratization space. Many of us uh, are scholars and teachers and also policy makers uh, or influencing policy and practices. And so we have started what we said is a way in which all of us can share through open access and open resources our teaching materials in any language to be shared by everybody through what is now going to be called the social justice and democratization space in any language and this is going to be also visual images we have one from mona already put here uh, uh, at the back but do read this back i know it's in fine print but for those of us who need those extra <laughs> visions, but please do take a look and do, do load your, you know, materials you have and share because everybody, this is an open access, open resource on human rights, public po policies, and all of it. So once again, social justice and democratization space, Vinita Sinha is going to be taking this over and working on it. Thank you.